Ah, sorry. Um, okay, there you go. Have a good session. Thank you. Thank you very much. So hi, everyone. Welcome to the session today in codes and extractors. So uh, we will hear five talks each uh, five minutes and then followed by 25 minutes of Q&A. So for the speakers, uh, please uh, stick to the five minutes and stick around until the end to answer questions. And for the audience, if you have questions, either post it on the Sulip, so the uh, Sulip link will appear in the chat or um, ask the question in the Q&A just by raising the hand, whichever you prefer. And yeah, I think uh, then with this, we're ready to start. Uh, you, do you want to uh, share your screen? Uh, sure. Okay, so can you the, see my Sorry. Yes, perfect, thank you. So yeah, the first talk of the session will be on smoothing out binary linear codes and worst case sub exponential hardness for LPN um, by Yu Yu and Zhang Tsang, and uh, you will give the talk. Sage is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to introduce our paper on how to prove a worst case uh, sub exponential hardness for LPN. And I'll start with the introduction. So the search version of, sorry, such version of the decoding problem asks to decode uh, out the message X given a noisy code word in presence of noise E. And the average case of uh, this problem is called learning parity with noise, where this matrix and secret is sampled uniformly from random. And uh, the noise is from, follows from the binary distribution. And we know that the worst case, worst case version of the problem is called the NCP, near, nearest code word problem. And in, it, in this case, we consider the promised version where this uh, noise vector vector is guaranteed to have an exact amount of Hamming weight. At the Eurocrypt uh, 2019, uh, Brack, Skedor gave the first worst case to average case reduction from NCP to LPN. Suppose we have an NCP instance as uh, visualized in this uh, uh, slide. So then we, uh, the, the goal is to tra uh, transform the NCP instance into an LPN sample by multiplying with a uh, uh, sparse vector R and XR this uh, message S, since it has no entropy at all with the uniform random mask Y. And we have by the smoothing lemma that uh, this, uh, the resulting sample is exactly follows, uh, exactly follow uh, is a, oh, sorry. That this, uh, the process generates the AMPN sample following the exact uh, distribution we needed. However, um, the result is not good enough because uh, you know, as we can see, uh, on the very strong assumption, we get the uh, uh, very conservative and uh, actually quite a weak result, which is a mostly a feasibility result. And and we can see the tension between the the tension between the um, you know the, the assumption and the conclusion is reflected on the range of the lambda. Right? So typically, we set lambda to be log n, and and this and in this work we are going to introduce. Uh, to generalize this lemma and to, to improve it. So here comes our first contribution. And we observe it's always easy to prove the unconditional case where the CI is uh, statistic statistically close to uniform, but proving the, uh, proving the uh, 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 conditional case, the CI is close to uniform given the leakages, uh, less efficient things we have to make sure that uh, this holds for all possible error X. So what we proved the following, we, we we show that uh, if I is drawn from a proper distribution, then the bond in the con conditional case is implied by that of the unconditional case, paying a reasonable uh, cost. So it suffices to prove, uh, prove that the easy con unconditional case for a specific code, such as balanced code and independent code. Now we omitted the details. So then we state our main, main theorem. First, we get similar result as BRVW. Then uh, we show that uh, uh, on the like uh, uh, our main result, which is not known before, if the low noise NCP problem has almost hardness, meaning that the best known attacks are almost optimal up to arbitrary polynomial speed up, then it implies that the sub exponential version, uh, sub exponential hardness for standard LPN where the noise is constant. Okay, so then uh, we also have uh, another cute result in the sense that. Uh, uh, we can reduce the LWE to larger field LPN. And on the, when, the, when the noise is very strong. And the proof is very simple. We can transform every LWE sample into an LPN sample using a random mask R, M, 
we just multiply multiplying the sample with the M. So the noise E in the L, LWE will become uh, ME in the LPN, where this uh, ME exactly follows uh, follows from the generalized binary distribution. Okay. So then I give a short summary of our work. We present the two worst case to average case reductions for different types of LWE, uh, sorry, LPN. And the larger field LPN can be reducible from LWE of the same modulus, and that's reducible from worst case uh, assumptions. Lattice assumptions. Secondly, we generalize reduction of via VW to, to from promise NCP to LV, LPN, eventually allowing to prove exponential hardness for standard LPN. And there remain a few open questions, such as how, how we can based on the hardness of LPN on promise NCP of any code with a non trivial mean Hamming weight, and how to construct the public key encryption or collision resistance uh, hash functions from the worst case decoding problems. Actually, we, we had a uh, we didn't we didn't get through because uh, the the hardness that we proved is not strong enough. And finally, how to find out more efficient and useful relations between LWE and LPN. Uh, this is uh, my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so um, yeah, if you have questions in the audience, please uh, stay around or post them already on Sulip. And uh, Peter, do you want to share your slides? And here you're still muted. Uh, did we just lose Peter? No, perfect. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I, you did lose me, but I'm here now. <laughs> okay, <course>. perfect. <laughs> Great. Um, Yes, so, I'll be yeah. presenting. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, so the next talk will be uh, Silver's uh, Silent Volley and Oblivious Transfer from Hardness of Decoding LDBC Codes. Um, this is uh, joint work by Peter Brindal, Srinivasan Raghu Raman, and Geoffroy Couteau. And Peter will give the talk. So now, stage is yours. All right. Thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, in this work, we present uh, improvements to a protocol for performing oblivious transfer and vector OLE. Uh, here, I won't talk too much about the OT case, but it's basically identical uh, to this VOL here. Uh, VOL is a two-party protocol with a sender and a receiver. And in our formulation of it, the sender should get a random vector B and a scalar delta over some field. And the receiver should get two random vectors A and C which are sort of all these are uniformly random subject to the correlation that C minus B equals Delta times A. Uh, so you can kind of think of this as a secret sharing of Delta times A um, being output to the parties. And then you can use this to do OT or, or various other protocols like PSI. Um, uh, I won't get into the details, but the, the way the protocol that we use works, it starts with this thing called a puncture PRF, which outputs uh, some keys to two parties. It's sort of not very interactive. And these keys can be locally expanded into uh, almost the correlation we want, except for the issue that A is actually sparse. So in the protocol, these vectors might be a length like a million, but A is a sparse vector, say a length, uh, say with weight like 20, or I mean, say like 200 or so. Uh, and so what we want to do is bootstrap this correlation to get the our, our desired correlation. and. To do this, we can apply the LPN assumption. Here, what we'll do is multiply these vectors from the left with a sort of more or less uniformly random matrix G. And this compresses uh, these vectors. And in particular, it makes this sparse A prime vector into a uniformly random uh, shorter vector A. And since G is linear, uh, we maintain our linear correlation and we get our final, uh, final uh, output. Um, so in our, in our case, we're doing, uh, we want to generate, mil, like say a million OTs or voles. And in this case, this matrix G will be very large, say order a trillion. And, uh, that makes multiplication extremely slow, uh, in, in the classic LPN setting where this matrix G needs to be uniformly random, uh, in order to get around this issue and get good performance, a lot of works have been looking at how to perform structure, uh, 
through structured LPN. Here we're, we allow G to have some extra structure, uh, which improves the running time of this multiplication. And uh, sort of prior works had to consider like uh, G with like N log N uh, overhead. And in this work, we design a new matrix which gets linear time uh, multiplication uh, while still maintaining the LPN uh, hardness. Uh, so we work over the dual version of LPN here, as I sort of said, is you multiply this, you do G times this sparse vector E and you should get a random output R. Um, there's been numerous attacks to, uh, over the years to try to break LPN uh, and it would be tedious to go through all of them. But fortunately we make this sort of, op and others have made this observation that you can sort of reduce this uh, setting to uh, where the adversary is allowed to pre-process the matrix and output this uh, sort of S vector V. And then their distinguishing power is basically just interproducting R with V. And this leads us to the sort of conclusion that really what we need to do is find an error correcting code G and H, which has high minimum distance. And then for efficiency, we want a good encoding time for the error correcting code. And we search for various codes and we end up landing on uh, low density parity check codes. These codes are sort of characterized by having a parity check matrix H, which is sparse. And this leveraging the sparsity, you can sort of solve the system of equations instead of doing the multiplication, the sort of intuition at least. And our, our uh, actual final parity check matrix is sort of depicted here. It's highly structured. And we, through extensive experimental evaluation, we can sort of conjecture it to have linear minimum distance along with some analytical results. Uh, but on the performance side, this code is extremely fast, maybe 20 to 40 times faster than prior, prior uh, uh, approaches uh, while still achieving the desired minimum distance. And this translates to extremely fast performance for our OT. Uh, previous work of Boyle et al. for doing sort of the same type of OT protocol, just with a different matrix, had a running time of like 10 seconds for 16 million OTs, while we get half a second. Uh, and we also beat sort of the classic IKMP OT extension approach uh, in running time and significantly in communication. Uh, we get a similar result for vector OLE, uh, roughly like five times faster than it looked from last year. And uh, yeah, for details, see the paper or the full talk. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, yeah, again, any questions, please post. And uh, Ilan um, will be the next speaker. Do you want to share your screen? So uh, the next talk will be on non-malleable codes for bounded polynomial depth tempering. Uh, this is a uh, joint work by Dana Dachman Soled, Ilan Komagotsky, and Rafael Pass, and Ilan will give the talk. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. So I'll talk about the problem of constructing non malleable code. So, non malleable code is this uh, primitive that allows you to, to work in the following uh, setting. There is a sender that has a message and it wants to transmit, them, transmit it to a receiver. So, it sends it over a digital channel. But there is a man-in-the-middle attacker that intercepts the message, changes it in an arbitrary way, and then forwards it to the receiver. So that's uh, the setting that we want to handle. And the non-malleable code allows you to do exactly that. Uh, informally, what we want is to make sure that the adversary that sits on the channel and modifies the message arbitrarily will not be able to modify the underlying message inside the encoding in a meaningful way. What do we mean by a meaningful a modification, it's that we want to make sure that the coded message is either the original message, which is great, the adversary didn't change anything, or it's something completely unrelated. And it's necessary to allow this un unrelated uh, decoding because the adversary could just intercept the message and send something completely independent or a random uh, sequence of bits. So we want an encoding scheme that guarantees that this is the only possible attack. And notice that we want efficient decoding. Okay, so this is a non-malleable code. It was introduced about 10 years ago, a little bit more, and it has it had tons of applications throughout complexity theory, coding theory, cryptography, of course, and more. Uh, see the paper or the full length doc for details. But I'll just tell you a couple of very basic facts. The first one is that if you want to be able to do efficient decoding, there is no way to construct a non-malleable code that is secure for an arbitrary polynomial time attacker. 
why the attacker could just perform decoding. And if the decoding is, let's say, if the underlying message is, say, zero, it can just send a bunch of zeros. That's clearly a tampering attack, a fairly tampering attack. And therefore, we cannot hope for a, a primitive that is both efficiently decodable and secure for any polynomial time attacker. So we must restrict the adversary in some way. So either it's by its running time or by the space complexity of the adversary or, or by the exact way it accesses the code word. And this is where this notion of split state adversaries comes up. So there's a bunch of ways to restrict the, the adversary. And probably the holy grail of this line of works is to say, OK, let's just imagine the strongest attacker we can. It's probably an attacker that runs in some, let's say, fixed polynomial time, let's say n to the 100. And we want to construct an encoding scheme, which is non-malleable, uh, and is uh, which is non-malleable for this class of attackers. So we first know the bound on the running time of the attacker, and then we construct our code. So this is probably the best you can do. And ideally, we want the encoding to run in fixed polynomial time, and only the decoding to take longer than the adversary. And this is necessary because of what I said in the previous slide. So this is the holy grail. Uh, there has been really tons of work towards this uh, holy grail, and it seems to be a really difficult problem, at least uh, in some regimes of parameters. And I'll mention just the most re relevant work. It's a work from two years ago by Bol et al. from Eurocrypt. They had a construction that essentially almost achieves the holy grail. They had a construction in the plane model, so there's no set of assumptions, no random oracle, no CRS, no nothing. But it relied on a somewhat strong assumption called P certificate. It's uh, essentially a one message argument system for P, which is uh, succinct in the uh, strongest sense you can imagine uh, in the, uh, the size of the, of, the, of the proof is independent of the statement, of the witness, of the computation time. It's just the shortest you, you can imagine. It's essentially instantiatable by Michalis CS proof system in the random oracle model, but it's an assumption that is stated without the random oracle. So it's a rather strong assumption. They obtained non malleability only for uniform adversaries. So the attacker that sits on the channel had to be a uniform machine, which is not what we typically want to, to guarantee in cryptographic constructions. They also only achieved non malleability for inverse polynomial uh, distinguishing advantage. So they didn't get negligible security, but only inverse polynomial. And the, both of their encoding and the decoding run longer than the attacker. This is the most relevant previous work. And what we achieve is a construction that essentially relies on three assumptions, a time lock puzzle, a one message non malleable commitment scheme, and the one message super polynomial simulation zero knowledge proof. Um, this is the definition of time of puzzle for whoever doesn't know it. It's a way to generate puzzles, uh, quickly generate puzzles without a, uh, to quickly generate puzzles and make sure that nobody can solve them uh, in some bounded amount of time, even if they use a lot of parallel processing power. And we use these assumptions uh, to construct a code, a non malleable code, where the encoding is really fast. It's independent of the time bound of the attacker. The coding is depending on the time, like what is, which is necessary. And it's non malleable for all attackers of some predefined uh, size. And we uh, solve all of the, I, I guess, disadvantage of the previous work. We get non-uniform security. We get negligible advantage. The encoding is fast. And we even get a stronger notion of non-malleability. In, in, by that, we capture attackers that have unbounded polynomial size. So it doesn't have to be arbitrarily. It doesn't have to be a priori bounded, as long as the depth of the attacker or the, the parallel runtime of the attacker is bounded. So we even capture a larger class. This is the meta theorem. And uh, we cannot use any instantiation of these assumptions. <laughs> uh, so we have a specific instantiation. Uh, we instantiate the time log puzzles with the repeated squaring assumption. Uh, one message non malleable commitments with a couple of additional assumptions. And the one message zero knowledge proof system with the same subset of assumptions. <clears throat> so we get the construction based on three assumptions, essentially. Uh, this is the instantiation, and the construction is also very simple to state. Uh, we only have three components in the construction. So an encoding only consists of a time lock puzzle, a non malleable commitment, and the proof that these two primitives, uh, that th these two objects are consistent in the sense that they have that same underlying message. 
So this is the encoding and the coding works by verifying the proof and then solving the puzzle. So it's very simple to state. And the, the challenge is in the proof. Uh, the proof is uh, very non-trivial. You could uh, imagine that because of this, this construction is similar to the Noah Young double encryption paradigm, uh, then the proof will, be, will follow a similar structure where we're gonna replace the real decryption or decoding in our case with a simulated one. But it doesn't really work in a straightforward way here because we have two primitives, one which is a super polynomial primitive, the, the non malleable commitment, and one is a time lock puzzle, which is a polynomial time primitive. So the construction I'm is- Sorry, can you wrap up? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So the idea is to use multiple axes of, of hardness, uh, size and non-uniformity, and to set up the primitives, uh, the hybrids in a careful way. So the, this is the conclusion I'm wrapping up. Uh, we can construct non malleable code for bounded polynomial depth attackers. The construction can be viewed as a non malleable time lock puzzle. And we have a follow up work where we perform a thorough study of this primitive. And there's a couple of interesting open problems to improve assumptions and the concrete efficiency. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting. And uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, again, please wait around for the questions and the next talk will be by Dakshita. Um, can you share your screen? Yes. And uh, so the next talk will be on improved. We're switching to extractors. The next talk will be on improved computational extractors and their applications. And this is a joint work by Dakshita Bana and Aksharam Srinivasam and Dakshita Vedipita. So um, hi everyone. Thanks Lisa for introducing the title of the talk. Um, this is a joint work with Akshay who's also here in the audience. Um, so this this is going this talk is going to focus on new construct um, new uh, types of extractors. Um, the first thing the first uh, primitive that we look at is a two source extractor, which uh, converts two independent weak sources to a nearly uniform um, source of randomness. Um, both sources uh, so so extractors uh, in settings where both sources have at least polylogarithmic uh, min entropy. Uh, were open for a while and um, were very recently constructed in breakthrough works by uh, Chattopadhyay et al. And then there's been a sequence of uh, information theoretic constructions of these extractors. Um, however, uh, in all of these information theoretic constructions, the error has not been negligible in, um, in N, which is the uh, length of the source. And, uh, in particular, this is because the running time of the extractor grows inverse polynomially uh, with the error. And this in, this in general appears to be uh, hard to remove in the information theoretic setting. And so um, one question that has been looked at in a few recent works is can we rely on cryptographic hardness assumptions so as to achieve uh, two source extractors with better parameters, lower error than, than our known uh, information theoretically. Um, and so uh, more specifically, the question is whether one can achieve two source extractors for polylogarithmic main entropy and negligible error. And under cryptographic hardness assumptions, um, these types of questions was first studied in a work of Kalai et al, um, who obtained uh, epsilon n entropy, negligible n error, assuming the existence of optimally exponentially hard one-way permutations. Um, and, um, Subsequently, in a recent work with uh, Yael Kalai and Ankit Gurg, uh, we obtained a construction for uh, polylogarithmic min entropy in one of the sources into the epsilon min entropy in the other one, and where the sources were themselves unbalanced uh, with error that was uh, also negligible. Uh, and here, uh, one, one difference from all the settings that I've uh, been talking about so far is that we considered the CRS model. Um, the CRS model, um, allows for a common random string, which is a common source of randomness, to be fixed once and for all, and allows for sources to depend on the CRS. Now, this is still interesting because um, unlike the case, the simpler case of seeded extractors for those that are familiar, um, two source extractors in the CRS model allow both sources to depend on the CRS. And uh, in particular, this reduces the need for true randomness to the single one-time requirement of a CRS, 
and then all sources can depend arbitrarily on, on it. Uh, I want to emphasize that in the computational setting, the sources are restricted to being efficiently sampleable, unlike the information theoretic setting. Um, there was also a work of Agarwal et al. that obtained epsilon n entropy and negligible n error in the CRS model, um, assuming quasi-polynomial hardness of DDH. Um, they built on uh, GKK20, and they also obtained polylogman entropy, assuming optimally hard collision-resistant hash functions. Uh, that brings me to what we do in this work. We also consider the CRS model and perform an improved analysis of the extractor in the GKK work. And in particular, we show that the same extractor actually can also handle balanced sources, where each source only needs to have polylogarithmic min entropy and allows for negligible error, essentially under the same assumption, which is sub-exponential DDH. Um, the second part of this work, uh, uses this result to obtain improved realizations of a few other types of extractors. And in particular, we look at network extractors and extractors for adversarial sources. These are two different types of extractors that consider settings where some of the sources may be adversarial in some way. Um, in, so uh, let me say a few words about, um, about the template for con uh, constructing two source extractors. Um, the first step follows a template of um, a BHK11 to obtain computational non-malleable extractors. And then the second step compiles any such extractor to a two source extractor. This is following a different information theoretic template of Benaroya et al. And combining these two steps together uh, gives a two source extractor with negligible error. The main barrier in, the, in, the, in, in this construction was that the proof technique of Benaroya et al crucially had an inefficient reduction. Um, and in the computational setting, dealing with inefficient reductions is hard. And so we had to do things to get around it. Um, and in particular, in GKK, uh, we use the leakage lemma to efficiently simulate some of the inefficient steps of this reduction. And in this work, uh, we perform a monolithic analysis of both steps one and two together. First, stripping off all the computational components to obtain an information theoretic experiment and then uh, performing, uh, uh, and, and then basically the inefficient part is only reduced to an information theoretic experiment. Um, now, let me say just a little bit about our applications. Um, the first one is to a network extractor protocol. Here, there's a bunch of sources that want to communicate over a public channel to end up with uniform randomness. And the challenge is that some of these sources may be adversarial and may send messages that depend on the messages sent by honest sources. So a lot like the settings of uh, MPC, uh, where the adversary may be rushing. And we want to guarantee that even given the transcript, the honest sources end up with computationally uniform randomness. And in general, network extractors uh, were first defined uh, and considered implicitly in this work of Dodis and Oliveira, and were made explicit in a bunch of other works. And so far, all these constructions have been information theoretic. Uh, we study this question in the computational setting. Um, and um, and uh, just, just for your reference, a bunch of prior work that I'm not going to spend too much time on. So in our work, we obtain a one round network extractor with negligible error for up to polynomially many participants, tolerating up to all but two corruptions where each source has polylogarithmic mean entropy and based on sub-exponential DDH. And the, I would say the first four bullets are somewhat optimal. The last one, the need for sub-exponential assumptions is not, so there, is, there may be some scope for improvement there. The second application that we look at is the setting of extractors for adversarial sources. So there's again a bunch of sources, some of which may be honest, the others may be adversarial, and are allowed to depend on few of the honest sources. Uh, extractors for adversarial sources were first introduced uh, uh, were introduced almost simultaneously in works of Chattopadhyay et al., Agarwal et al., and um, Dodis et al. And, um, sorry, can you yeah. also wrap up soon? I'm yes. really sorry to interrupt. Last slide. <laughs> Last slide, I promise. Uh, so, uh, um, and so they were uh, introduced in these three different works that considered different flavors of this definition. We work with the flavor um, that was introduced in Chattopadhyay et al., and we obtain extractors for adversarial sources um, handling two out of a total of polynomially many, uh, two honest sources out of a total of polynomially many sources with polylog min entropy and negligible error. 
and where each adversarial source is allowed to depend on at most one of the two honest sources. Uh, with that, I want to wrap up. Um, I'll just display these open problems here in case anyone wants to take a look. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for your talk. And yeah, please stay around for questions. And we're going to move on to the next talk. Uh, Sai, can you please share your screen? So uh, the last talk of the session is on adaptive extractors and their application to leakage resilient secret sharing. This is joint work by Nishan Chandran, Bana Kan. Nukuti, Sai Lakshmi Bana Ubatu, and Shruti Sekha, and Sai will give the talk. Thank you, please. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so in this talk, we'll first begin with talking about adaptive extractors, and then we'll go on to leakage frequency sharing. So, to begin with, randomness extractors take in an entropic source and a uniform seed and ensure that the extractor output is indistinguishable from uniform even given the seed and any arbitrary short leakage that's purely dependent on the seed. The question that we consider is that whether the leakage can depend on the seed and the challenge as well, where by challenge we mean the sample that needs to be distinguished. A general answer to this question would be no, because there could be leakage functions that check whether the challenge equals the extractor output or not. So is this the end of the story? Well, through this work, we actually show that this is really not the end of the story by introducing adaptive extractors. We say an extractor is adaptive with respect to a leakage function family. If for every function in the family, the extractor output looks indistinguishable from uniform, even given the seed and the adaptive leakage dependent on the source seed and the challenge. So here we would like to just note that uh, we consider the notion of adaptive extractors in its full generality in this paper, uh, while some implicit uh, while some specialized variants were also implicitly studied in the work of Zimmern and Agrawal et al. as well. So moving on. Uh, in our paper, we specifically consider the following leakage family where we allow the leakage to arbitrarily depend on the challenge and we refer to this family as the output adaptive family. We show that every extractor is indeed an output adaptive extractor with slight loss in parameters and show a non-trivial application of this output adaptive extractors in building leakage resilient secret sharing schemes. Finally, concluding on adaptive extractors, yeah, the area is wide open and it will be really interesting to study other leakage families. Moving on to secret sharing schemes, an n-party t-threshold secret sharing scheme lets uh, to share MSH m into n shares such that any t plus one of the share can reckon, uh, are useful in reconstructing the message and any T of them have no information about the secret. Further, a secret sharing scheme is set to satisfy leakage resilience against a leakage family. If for every leakage function in the family and any two secrets M and M prime, the leakage on shares of message M is, indistingu is indistinguishable from leakage on shares of message M prime. Now, moving ahead, some parameters of interest for leakage LRSS are fixed rate, which is the ratio of secret size to the share size. And the most important thing is the leakage model. Most of the leakage models that were studied in the literature can be categorized uh, based on whether they support joint leakage on the shares or whether, whether they support adaptive leakage on the leakage queries. So with this, We'll move. We'll just uh, move on to some high-level overview of prior work. So, LRSS has seen a very interesting light of work, but for the purpose of this talk, we'll restrict ourselves to relevant prior work in the information theoretic setting. From the perspective of it, the best work uh, till now is due to Srinivasan and Watson achieving an impressive rate of one third, but. The model that they support is very basic, which is the independent and non-adaptive leakage model. From the perspective of leakage models, the works due to Chattopadhyay et al. and Kumar et al. perform better. So here it's important to note that uh, even for any restricted setting of NNT, there have been no adaptive or joint LRSS, which has cost shifted. So in this work, in our work, we precisely bridge this gap by 
giving a compiler that compiles any secret sharing scheme into a corresponding LRSS in the joint and adaptive leakage model that just uses an extractor as a building block. Further, we show that when NNT or of say much protocol order and when each joint leakage query is only on constant number of shares, this, there exists an instantiation of the LRSS with constant rate. So for the details on the construction model and application, uh, I ask the audience to refer to the paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your talk, Sai. And uh, thanks again, uh, all the speakers of the session for all the great talks. And we're moving on to uh, Q&A now. Uh, so I see we have some questions um, on, um, we have some questions on uh, Sulip. So we have a question for, uh, for Peter. And um, what bandwidth setting did you use for the benchmarks at the end of your talk? Peter, are you? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Sorry. Thanks. Just a little delayed. Uh, I think we were in the land setting, uh, but it communicates so little. It's like megabytes for millions of OTs. So it's like it, it's it's already the least communication heavy protocol, and uh, so we didn't bother with doing latency and stuff. But basically, just round trip over if you want to do some other stuff. Okay, thanks, uh, Peter. So next question is for Ilan. Uh, I'm not sure if I missed this, but what is the security property that you need from a non-malware commitment, like uh, non with respect to commitment or opening? Um, so I answered in the bottom. We're using uh, the previous works that constructed non malleable commitments, and both of them achieve uh, non malleability with respect to commitment. So that's what we use. Okay, thank you. Um, ah, yeah, now I see it, <laughs> thanks. Um, okay, so we have a second question for Peter. Uh, what do, can you say about the security of silver against the text that don't fit into the linear model? Um, am I correct in thinking that Ray Solomon is insecure for LPN because you can use an efficient syndrome decoder to find the noise? Uh, uh, RS has a parity check with high minimum distance so the attack doesn't fit the linear model, which makes me think that codes with too much structure may have attacks that don't fit in the linear model. Yeah, uh, I mean, we, we did our best we could to try to address such things, but it is an open question. Um, in the work, in the paper itself, we sort of frame it as an open question. Uh, we invite people to come look at the code and try to do it. Uh, I guess the idea is like, if you can break it, you're gonna to have to somehow definitely use the structure of the code and in like a novel way. And uh, yeah, we weren't able to break it, but uh, doesn't mean uh, no one could. So it's open question, I invite you to check. Thanks, Peter. Uh, do we have any more? I don't see any more questions on Sulip. Do we have any more questions in the audience here? Anyone want to go ahead and ask a question? Uh, yes, Patrick, please go. Thank you very much. So I think this question is for the before last talk. Um, I'm not entirely sure, sorry, how to pronounce your name. It's on the, it's on the extractors, the two extractors. So my question will be like, how realistic is this model in the CRS? Because essentially when you have extractors, you assume that you have a very small seed and then you have some public value then you have some randomness and then eventually you want to have a, something close to uniform. But in the CRS model, so while well, you need an extremely long string, I understand that you would need it only once, but uh, somehow how realistic would that be? And my second question was, are you aware of the work by Evgeny Dodis in 2019 at Europe, I think, where he was basically investigating uh, to the random number generators without seeds? So I was wondering if you thought about something in that direction or not. Um, so, uh, so, to answer, so let me answer your first question first. How realistic is this setting? Um, I think it's an interesting setting because uh, you, like I was saying in the talk, you can generate this CRS once and for all. So you need this one time good randomness. And then you can have sources that are allowed to depend on the CRS. So in that sense, it's different from the seeded extractor setting. Um, and there could be situations where it is hard to get a seed that is completely independent of your sources. Uh, but you can have a CRS and, and where, where the sources actually do depend on it. So, um, so these are different settings. I 
realisticness i i don't know i hesitate to say that any of these are very realistic so um, um and to your second question um uh, yes i'm aware of uh, yevgeny's uh, work but i uh, i am not uh, i'll have to look at it in more detail to actually draw some sort of comparison with this um i'm happy to look at it and get back to you offline okay thank you very much um okay so any more questions from the audience so we have another question in the chat uh, to peter uh, i suppose the computational cost is also lesser than fireworks can you say something more and how much less is the computational cost compared with fireworks things yeah um yeah, basically in the prior works that follow this L dual LPN structure, almost all the overhead was just evaluating the code. And so we sort of reduced that by a large margin. And now it's more balanced between this like uh, punctured PRF setup phase and the code. Actually, I think the code is even faster than punctured PRF. So now we sort of shifted the main overhead to like the other parts of the protocol. Uh, and so that's comparing to the prior work based on dual LPN. Uh, the other main point of comparison is is um, IKMP, which is sort of traditional OT extension approach. And here we get basically better efficiency due to not needing to do this like matrix transpose operation and obviously not sending the data, which is maybe the main benefit. Uh, so those are the two points, two primary points. There's also this primal LPN OT protocols out there. And there we get better computational efficiency just because theirs is quite heavily involved and have to do this iterative step. Um, which adds overhead versus we sort of directly uh, go. Uh, overall, it's asymptotically linear. Uh, we generate like, it's like two N AES calls for N OTs, uh, something like that. Uh, so it's quite, quite efficient. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Um, so unless there's um, any more questions in the audience now, then I, I will take, uh, I will ask a question. Um, so I have a question uh, for you. Uh, you um, on the last slide, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the gap, so that you can't that, that we don't know uh, how to base collision-resistant hashing or public key encryption on the hardness of uh, of NCP. Um, so what is your what would be your guess or your feeling? Are you optimistic that this is just like something small missing and 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 it's, it's possible to get there or do you see any concrete point in the analysis that could be improved to get there or like you think this is maybe uh, yeah far um, too i don't know i'm not very op optimistic about that because uh, i i also call sort of the work that they can construct uh, pke and the uh, college cih from sub, -expo sub exponential hard uh, lpn in that case, we push all the all the possibilities, and in this work, in this work, we do also try to like optimize everything. And finally, we have we, we we it's very close, but uh, we didn't make it. I think this may maybe some kind of a separation. I don't know, but uh, it's, uh, there was a little open question. But my guess okay, is yeah. uh, it's not maybe it's not so, so easy. To... Okay, very interesting. Thanks. Um... Uh, Lisa, if there is time, I, I can answer the Kshita's question. This is Evgeny. Um, I can answer the Kshita's question uh, about seedless extractors. But uh, yeah, I think I think it's a different setting. So in our Europe paper, um, it was a seedless extractor, but uh, it was inherently in some kind of idealized model. Like uh, So essentially, we formalize a heuristic how to extract deterministically randomness from official sampleable sources using cryptographic hash functions. So it was kind of incomparable. Uh, last year, we did have a standard model extension uh, of this work, but those extractors were not seedless, but they were seeded. But uh, um, in some sense, the sampler who samples the distribution only has Oracle access to the extractor uh, when, when he samples. Um, so it's a very good question, but I guess incomparable models overall. Thanks. Thanks. So uh... I have a question if we still have time for. Yes, know. yes, we have time. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, Alexandra. Uh, hi, hi, Evgeny. Thanks for answering that question. Um, 
So, uh, Ilan, I, I wanted to ask, you use a um, time lock puzzle as some sort of object that's hard along some axis of hardness from, from the non-malleable commitment, but also efficiently decodable. Um, and so c can this be generalized? Can this be, be uh, I see that time lock puzzles are really useful in your setting, but um, could, could this yeah, be generalized? Yeah, I think there's nothing, there's nothing uh, really inherent about time lock puzzles. They just fit really well with other primitives. Uh, right, we know how to construct non-malleable commitments, uh, basically from only one assumption, which is non-malleable, uh, which is time lock puzzles. Uh, yeah, we, we, so uh, I, I guess, oh from, no, yeah. right, we also have from LWE, <laughs> from Quantum LWE. Um, so yeah, so probably there's nothing super inherent about it. We just need to fit all the pieces together. Uh, okay. I don't think there's anything inherent about time of puzzles, so the proof might uh, go through with other assumptions or other instantiations. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I have one more question for uh, Sai. So in, 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 in the long talk, um, the, the, the um, scheme you present, uh, the rate uh, degrades, so you have this parameter H and the, the rate degrades with one over H to support large, larger leakage H times T. So you have like kind of a linear trade-off between, uh, between the rate and the amount of leakage you can support. Do you have any, is this like inherent in, in the model or is this something that just that your approach uh, gives to, is there any known results or can you say anything about this? Yeah, no, this is not inherent to the model. This is inherent to the construction. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, so do you think uh, like this can be improved upon or, or I guess that that would require very, like may maybe very different techniques or? Yeah, might be possible, yeah, there is still some hope, yeah. Okay. Yeah, with better uh, analysis, uh, I mean, so currently this is the best that we have, yeah, but yeah, we still have some more. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? I don't see any more question. Maybe then I have a question to Ilan. Uh, so, Um, so, so you 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 pose it as an as an open open question in in getting rid of the mostly of the keyless hash function and and can you give a bit of intuition why this is hard or so 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 I guess if you would this is uh, this is is this is this uh, or is the main purpose to allow to get rid of the the CRS and to get also a security against uh, non uniform adversaries or what is like what is the role and what is the challenge there can you Elaborate a bit on that. So the keyless uh, hash functions are used to get security against non-uniform attackers. Uh, it, so it's not a serious assumption. It's just an assumption that such a function exists. I guess the challenge is that there's only, we're using non-malleable commitments in our construction. And there's basically two constructions or very few constructions. And one of them uses keyless hash functions and the other doesn't but it used some other form of, uh, of hardness, which is like quantum hardness. Mm. Uh, so it might be possible to get rid of them by replacing it with a different kind of assumption, but it will, you will pay in some other place. So something else will, will be less good. Uh, maybe the coding will need to be quantum or something like that. Okay. It, okay. It's possible, it's possible. I, yeah, I yeah, with the, yes. Yeah. Yeah, with the with the CRS, I just meant like, would it get much easier? Like your construction yeah, yeah, would yeah. allow it. Yeah, yeah, CRS yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. If there's a CRS, okay. the the whole problem becomes essentially trivial. Ah, uh, okay, okay, thanks, thanks. Um, very interesting. Maybe not trivial, but known. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Um, okay. Um, what's the time? I guess uh, we're out of time. So uh, if there's no more question from the audience, and yeah, I don't see any new questions on Sulip right now. So yeah, thank you.